Welcome back to the Belmont Book Club. Today we'll continue with the numerical discourses, chapters of the sixes and sevens. Getting through there. There are six roots of escape. The escape from ill will is the liberation of the mind by loving kindness, metta. The escape from cruelty is the liberation of the mind by compassion. The escape from discontent is the liberation of the mind by altruistic joy. And escape from attachment is the liberation of mind by equanimity. Additionally, the escape from all signs of signless is the signless liberation of mind. And the escape from the dart of doubt and perplexity is the uprooting of the conceit, quote, I am, quote. And I include this one for the first four as it's inside to the Brahma Viharas or the heavenly abodes, which we've speak, spoken about time again. It's a, a juxtaposition of from metta, loving kindness, ill will being its, its opposite, compassion, cruelty, altruistic or sympathetic joy, discontent, and an equanimity with attachment. That was kind of a cool insight. There are six roots to disputes, and the Buddha, roots of disputes. The Buddha says that a monk is angry and revengeful, contemptuous and domineering, envious and avaricious, deceitful and fraudulent, has evil wishes and wrong views, and adheres to his own views, holding on to them tenaciously and relinquishing them with difficulty. Such a monk dwells disrespectfully and without deference toward his teacher, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Which are the three jewels of Buddhism. Now, if you see any of these roots in yourself <clears throat> or externally, he says, you should strive to abandon those same evil roots and disputes. And if you do not see any of these roots of disputes, either in yourselves or externally, you should practice in such a way that those same evil roots of disputes do not erupt in the future. That's a really cool sutta number. Um, called the simile of the lute, number 130 in the Book of Sixes. And two brief parts of it are follows. So Buddha asks, Sonia, why weren't you now just thinking of giving up the training and returning to lay life, so stopping to become a monk? Yes, Lord, he says. Tell me, Sona, when in earlier days you lived at home, were you not skilled in playing the lute? Yes, Lord. And so now, when the strings of your lute were too taut, was your lute well-tuned and easy to play? No, Lord. And when your strings of the, your lute were too loose, was your lute well-tuned and easy to play? No, Lord. But so now, when the strings of your lute were neither too taut nor too loose, but adjusted to an even pitch, was your lute then well-tuned and easy to play? Yes, Lord. Similarly, so now, if energy is applied too forcefully, it will lead to restlessness and if energy is too lax, it will lead to lassitude. Therefore, Sona, keep your energy in balance, penetrate to a balance of the spiritual faculties, and there seize your object. Additionally, in the same sutta, there's a cool little sort of poem at the very end, and it goes like this. Just as a rocky mountain is not moved by storms, so... Sights, sounds, tastes, smells, contacts, and ideas, which are the six sense inputs of Buddhism, those, whether desirable or undesirable, will never stir one of steady nature, whose mind is firm and free, who sees how all things pass. As we move on to the chapter of the seven, there's a cool little discussion of a friend. It says, a friend, O monks, should be followed when he possesses seven factors. What seven? He gives what is difficult to give. He does what is difficult to do. He patiently endures what is difficult to endure. He reveals his own secrets. He keeps others' secrets. He does not abandon one in misfortune, and he does not despise one because of one's loss. A friend should be followed when he possesses these seven factors. Pretty cool. Now, this is a, the last one we'll, we'll cover today is called The Seven Bonds of Sexuality. And this is a Buddhist take on celibacy, which you'll see how deep it goes. So, number one, he does not engage, he does not, 
He does not actually engage in coitus with women. Two, nor does he allow himself to be anointed, massaged, bathed, or rubbed by them. Women, that is. Nor does he joke with women, play with them, and amuse himself with them. Nor does he gaze at women and stare at them in the eye. Nor does he listen to the sounds of women behind a wall or through a fence as they laugh, talk, sing, or weep. Nor does he recollect his laughing and talking and playing with women in the past. Nor does he see a householder or householder's son enjoying himself endowed and furnished with the five chords of sensual pleasure. It's a very deep and specific definition of deep celibacy here. And one wonders with about with the joking and playing and amusing yourself with women and even gazing them staring at the eye. It seems like I guess I could see where this and if you think of like dependent origination, how this would lead to uh, lustful thoughts. And I wonder if with these prohibitions it would seem to sort of separate men from women in a sense of that they're this like sort of forbidden, tempting entity that can't really be trusted. I'll leave you to think about that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.